I watched a video on YouTube from Rebel Wisdom with this guy, Warren Farrell. I'd heard of him before. He's written a number of books, including The Myth of Male Power. When I heard of him, it was, it was with negative connotation around his name. This is the guy who started all of that bitter incel stuff is kind of the... Yeah, he's evil. What I picked up sure. about him. And I watched this and was struck, because I, I recognize him, by how tender he was. And I mentioned to you... 20 minutes into the interview, he's kind of the guest of honor. There's one other woman, but he's by far the most famous. And there's a third panelist who is not famous. He goes, I just want to say you haven't had a chance to speak. Like, you know, and he brings this third younger woman panelist in. And as he's telling his story, it becomes clear he was very active in, the, in second wave feminism in the 60s and is truly, it, he's like wants equality. Yeah. His view of it is that Gender roles evolved based on survival needs, and we have evolved past them. Mm -hmm. So all of these customs and norms, which included at the time, his first one was like, we don't have enough girls in sports. We don't have enough women in the professions. Not that they have to be, but they need to be given the same sort of freedom to enter these and social allowance. Like, it shouldn't be looked down upon. So how did he switch from a very progressive <laughs> feminist, mm -hmm. like leading the feminist movement, feminist, to a... Men's right activist. So this is the story. Is he was in? He was on the board of Now, which is a women's organization, uh, and started talking about equality for boys. And I forget exactly w with regards to what, but you could imagine at the time it was there was a male only draft, and he was seeing. Uh, I remember now what it was. It was that when it came down to kids in divorces, he was like, let's do what's best for the kids. And the organization, because they were represented by women, were like, no, let's make sure that mothers are the default custodians. Mm. And, and that was where they split. And so he stopped getting invited to speak at feminist things. And his thing was not mothers shouldn't get <laughs> right. He said the so, fact that your, your genitals shouldn't determine whether or not you get custody of a kid in a yes. divorce. And in fact, he was advocating in this case for less freedom for everybody. It's like, you can't leave the state if you have a divorce. Like the, the child needs access to their mother and father frequently, and mm. you shouldn't be able to pick up and leave. So he was very much advocating, which is funny because children are both grow into both men and women. He wasn't yeah. anti-women or anti-men. He was <laughs> he was pro the, the most vulnerable aspect of this relationship, but was summarily uninvited from a lot of events, no longer allowed to speak. And that was when he moved into the men's rights stuff, which was the flip side of it. So if women need to be encouraged to be in the workplace, males should be allowed to be stay at home's dad without any sort of social pressure, uh, which I would say we haven't quite arrived at yeah. yet. Well, you would, you mentioned a little off air, but he's all, he also be a proponent of like splitting bills, 50, 50 yes. women getting drafted. He, he really just wants everyone to be treated the same you don't even know the gender of someone. It's basically not in the real, like not when you're face to face, but in terms of the laws and mm -hmm. things like that, you just don't have gender at all in law, basically. I think, I think what he's saying, gender roles served an important purpose for survival, but yeah. we have gotten past those and he wants us to leave behind all of the old beliefs about what a man should do and what a woman should do insofar as they are no longer necessary to survival. So he talks about why we have women's studies but not men's studies. And then people respond, well, history is just men's studies. And I thought it was really interesting. He says, women's studies questions the female role. History sells the traditional male role of hero and performer. Women's studies tells women that they have the right to the traditional male role. Nothing tells men they have the right to the traditional female home. Rights to stay at home, full or part time while the wife supports him. Um, and I thought it was interesting because while history, we do often talk about men, his point is that it doesn't question that the idea of a great man is Genghis Khan, <laughs> Alexander the Great, are people who who Roosevelt. Yes, yes. There are no stay-at-home dads mm -hmm. in history class, and so he's saying, look, we can tell history, and we can include uh, the quote-unquote great women who uh, shaped Earth and, and and the geograph, not the geographic, the political climate that we're in. But what he's advocating for is a men's studies thing, which questions the male gender role yeah. of provider and and all of these the most interesting thing to me is how quickly he got demonized when he stuck with <clears throat> equality <laughs> yeah like because he was like all about equality all about equality and he's being lauded in the 60s and 70s yeah and then stuck with that line and quickly got demonized yes and what he says which i think is an interesting point and it's so unfortunate because it, it, it just marks the tribalism is that he does seem to me someone who is who is interested in truth and is interested in what's best. So at one point he becomes a stepdad uh, to a kid, and he's and for this purpose he starts researching like what's the best way to be a stepdad? What do I do? 
And what he finds is the number one thing that he can do as a stepdad is, fa- is facilitate a relationship between this child and their biological dad. Wow. <laughs> and he's like, I was uh, surprised, maybe a little bit disappointed to find that it wasn't about me. It was it was about this this connection with one's biological father. Even though male role models are important, there was some sense of like, who am I? Where's the person that looks like me? Where is the the pattern which I am following and what does that say about me? And if that is empty and it is just a male figure, that's better than nothing, but it, it tends to correlate with worse outcomes. Is that true of sons and daughters? He says it is, in his research, it is particularly pronounced with sons. Okay, because so the way you're describing it, says it, it negatively impacts both. The way you're describing it just made it seem like it was focused on sons because it's like, who am I supposed to emulate? Well, I assume mm. the daughter doesn't emulate her father in many yeah. cases. Well, I think this was actually a case of, I think his stepchild was a, a girl. But in any event, it, it negatively impacts both people to not have, both men and women to not have a relationship with their dad. So anyway, I took from that, I don't know. I don't know the guy personally. What a shitty takeaway if you're the stepdad. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not that you can't do anything. You can still have a positive impact. But he's like, and he said, I was successful. I was able to uh, make, make them have a closer relationship and ensure that the family did not drift away from the biological father. Uh, so I take from that, and again, these could be all just be stories he tells to butter me up or whatever, that he is genuinely interested in the truth uh, of these things. He's got a couple other interesting things. Feminism as being primarily about class. He says, if you look at second, third wave feminism, what it is optimizing for is freedom, right? They want freedom to the, the traditional male role, which he fully supports, or the traditional female role, which he fully supports, or a, a mix and none of these, which he fully supports. What he does note is that in its current capacity of like free love, I want to work, that is primarily an upper class thing, which is to say that if you're lower class and you tend towards free love, do whatever I want, you will wind up pregnant and you will not be able to pay someone to facilitate the the caretaking of that child versus if you're upper class, you're more likely to use birth control. If you do get pregnant, you're more likely to be able to pay an au pair or a nanny to take care of it. So he... He just comments on how uh, feminism, as we've seen it, as this total freedom, uh, has problems and is and has been localized to one class and perhaps even more um, dangerous is seeking freedom from everything, which makes sense. But the one freedom that he does not want men or women either to be able to escape is the freedom from being an active parent. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he's like, I'm all for freedom up and until children are involved. And at that point, your freedom is needs to be severely curtailed. You can't leave the state. You can't do this. You can't move away from you. Like all of a sudden, uh, the rights of the child supersede everything else. So it's just interesting. I'm only one chapter in. I can't talk too much about it. So I don't know if we should title this episode "The Myth of, of Male <laughs> Power" or the next one. But I've I've just started reading it, and it's very interesting. I find myself underlining often because hmm. there's a lot of things that I hadn't done uh, thought about. Let me see if there's anything else in here, real quick. Um. Yeah, divorce, all that kind of stuff. Oh, just a handful of other things early on. We've mentioned this in the past. The idea of the, he talks about power dynamics. It's 1993. He's ahead of his time. And he talks about how women in the workplace often perceive power dynamics as being male dominated because in the workplace in 1993, especially power was held by men. Mm -hmm. But he says what women don't see is that at the opposite end of the spectrum, they don't even consider their garbage man. They don't even consider, uh, all of these people who they do not work with. So they think, oh, men have power, but they're neglecting that they are looking at the top percentage of men who do in fact have power and ignoring the roofers, crab fishermen, frontline soldiers, all of these people who uh, feel very powerless in society. Mm. Um, And so his whole point is like, look, history has been rough to men and women in different ways. And we need to start to understand these different ways. So I, I can I can keep elaborating, but he does uh, exercises at his events where, for instance, all the men come on stage, he has them take off their shirts, and he has the women criticize and pick apart the way that they look, you know, just to down to the nittiest gritty thing to give them an experience of what it is like just for a moment to to feel the, the gaze of the world like mm-hmm. women often do. And then he takes women on stage and he ranks them in order of – uh, highest earner to lowest earner. And then he takes like the bottom 60% and says, you are all losers. I want everyone to look at these people and let them know that they have failed in their duty as a woman because mm-hmm. <laughs> and like just to facilitate, oh God, like I'm keenly aware of the problems and the uh, pressures of my own life, but I'm 
utterly blind <laughs> to yeah. to what somebody else might feel. So it's it's just very interesting so far. Well, you had mentioned something similar about how when you look at the past and you think about men, you get the sense that men had power in the past because the most powerful people were men. Mm -hmm. But that treating men as a monolith is a little bit strange because also every person brutally murdered on the front lines of battle was a man. And you were much more likely to survive to a certain age mm -hmm. and have children if you were a woman. Yeah. Like most men were just getting killed off before then, basically. Yes. So history, just treating, any, I mean, this is like a common refrain we have on the podcast, treating anyone as a monolith based on gender, race, yeah. sexuality is a little bit silly and kind of falls apart because some men had power mm -hmm. and a lot of men did not. Yes, yes. And I think he, he says something like, the core flaw of feminism is that assuming that because women felt powerless that men must have had power. Uh, and again, you can understand it in the context of like, oh my gosh, all the presidents are men and the CEOs are men and the big movers and shakers. But it's, it's like, you got to look at the guys who were building the skyscrapers 100, 100 well, stories yeah, in the air kind of, and like funny. laying down the railroad spikes. And I kind of feel like a lot of this is just a trick to make people not look at class. To not look at wealth. Because if you look through history, it's like, who are the most powerful people? Mm -hmm. Wealthy men. Who are the second most wealthy <laughs> Or most powerful people. Second most powerful. Wealthy women married to wealthy men. Right? They're going to have a better quality of life than the coal miners. Mm -hmm. So it just seems like anytime we're trying to divide ourselves, it often feels like that's the best way to divide ourselves. There's a couple, of, I, I agree, that, that w I've heard it said that like feminism is just, we've talked about this, is just consumerism evolving, which is to say, you know what would be cool? If women needed to buy a bunch of stuff to go to work, including clothes, and had extra disposable money so that they could contribute to buying more stuff that they don't need in order to succeed in the rat race. So mm -hmm. it's just an evolution of consumerism. But it's also like, there's, there's a core flaw, which is that power and happiness is a zero-sum game. And it's not totally wrong. It's like, look, it is nicer to have people do things for you than to be the servant, obviously. Mm -hmm. But even even assuming that because the poor people are miserable that the rich people must have therefore been, uh, I know this is, this is controversial, better off meaningfully. And we've talked about this. We live in a world where rich people are literally committing suicide. <laughs> you know, we talked about Avicii and uh, you, can, you can start naming your favorite celebrity that had everything and, and killed himself. It is... Uh, it's confused. And the second thing is it's like, wow, it's so weird how easy it is to band into tribes. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It's like, you know, all, then all the women come together and all the men come together and they all decide that they hate each other and they air their grievances and they feel camaraderie in in hating someone where it, where it doesn't make sense. It's almost ludicrous to view history. And now that I've like, I've viewed it this way as, as primarily about conflict between men and women. It's like you do realize that every human who ever was birthed came from the union yeah, of yeah. a man and a woman. And that all of these societies where you could view it as as women being in an inferior role and in many ways they were controlled, were subjugating entire other tribes in far harsher ways, literally exterminating them when given the chance. So to say that it's primarily men versus women and not tribe versus tribe or nature versus people seems uh, myopic. Yeah, I agree. Um, but it's it's interesting. I'll get deeper into the book. We could talk about it as I go. Was there anything else? Yeah. The, he, he often just talks about the opposite of what of all these terms that we have. So he says we talk about the glass ceiling, but we don't talk about the glass cellar, which is the bottom, you know, the, all these bottom jobs. We talk about the power that men have, but we don't talk about the genetic celebrity of women. Um, and yeah, and he does seem like someone who is just like, he just wants to see men staying at home and women playing in sports and women being presidents. And he's like... And women getting drafted. And women getting drafted. And uh, I think he would say that there are areas where it does not make sense. It's like, look, if you are doing the job of a firefighter and your job is to carry a unconscious person out of a building, I don't care if you're a man and a woman, but you need to be able to lift 180 pounds. But that's <laughs> yeah. still a gender neutral policy. Yes, but the outcome would skew. Well, I think, outcome, yeah. I think outcomes is the dumbest thing to look at. Well, he is concerned with outcomes. He's yeah. like, we don't have enough women playing sports. And he's like, I think that we could if they were encouraged. And, and, and that's what we've seen is that women's sports has grown tremendously since the 60s.
Hope that you guys enjoyed that clip. If you want to see more like this and have us do more podcasts, we are 100% funded by our generous patrons. And if you'd like to contribute, there's a link in the description and we'll have one pop up on the screen right here so that we can do more podcasts where we have fun conversations and hopefully some deep ones like this. Either way, hope that you enjoyed the video and I will see you in the next one.